फ्रेंड्स एंड कॉलिंग्स वेलकम टू टूडेज स्पेशल सेशन इट इज आर हंड्रेड वेबिनार सेंटेनियल ऑपरेशन एंड इट इज टू बी टेकन बाय नन अदर देन डॉक्टर अब्दुल अंसारी sir has been a very strong supporter of our program right from the first webinar he has been on multiple webinars and whenever i have asked him he is without hesitation agreed to spare his time and his teaching has been invaluable and uh, we thank him very much for that and apart from that you all know that he is a shining beacon in intensive care a inspiration to all of us very dedicated hard working and knowledgeable sir thank you very much sir so the topic for today is uh, severe acute pancreatitis and this topic has been chosen because i feel and i think many of us feel this is a really difficult topic you know mortality is very high and management has to be really up to the mark uh, in these patients uh, so that without further ado we shall start uh, but before that i would also like to thank all our faculty you know our young india institute faculty who have taken various webinars over the last one and a half two years and really thank them for their selfless teaching without whose support and the contribution we wouldn't have reached uh, this stage so thank you everybody and over to ansari sir thank you dabesh first of all at the outset i would say this was an amazing responsibility and uh, a centennial you know uh, webinar talk especially on why i square that is young india intensivist platform is really amazing i can only say that this is uh, you know an amazing platform for all the young budding intensivists to proceed and discuss about important critical care topics and this will be very very important and i think uh, uh, without uh, you know wasting much of time let's delve into the topic severe acute pancreatitis as tapesh very rightly said has a very high implication for general intensive care has been very very important for uh, clinicians intensivists gastroenterologists and surgeons all together in fact i always say that if one case has to highlight complete critical care it would be severe acute pancreatitis it definitely involves uh, you know undulating course uh, waxing waning uh, clinical profile uh, multiple interventions multiple inputs and a patients from the intensivist at various stages aggression and also a diagnostic acumen so thank you very much this case is actually uh, uh, the today's discussion i had actually thought that we should have two parallel streams of guideline versus a case or and what we can call as theoretically a living guideline so we while we will be talking about the the case i would like to also actually highlight what are the pertinent evidence for what we were doing in this particular case and uh, uh, when we look back we always find that we were perhaps lacking in a lot of areas but at the same time it gives you wisdom to you know improve upon your care for the next time so uh, with this i would like to actually thank dr prachi kulkarni she is our A junior consultant and she has been very hard working vigilant simultaneously managing and recording the events because we were lucky enough to know a, a month in advance that we have to present a case and this case actually unfolded right from 8th of september to 22nd of october just a few days back so it was a complete profile actually going on as we will discuss about that so thank you prachi and with this uh, we will move on to the case am i audible so far uh, very, clear, very clear, clear sir loud and clear please tell me so starting with this is the organ that we are talking about pancreas as you all know the leafy structure which is very delicately placed in the retro peritoneum very nicely uh, between the stomach and the duodenum very nicely placed in fact it is said that god placed pancreas in the retro peritoneum that no surgeon can disturb it unnecessarily so i i would say that this is one of the most uh, what is called uh, you know uh, very very delicately placed vital structure which actually shows its presence when it is inflamed in a regular scenario actually it works quietly like a quiet work horse exocrine and endocrine two portions of this uh, you know uh, organ the exocrine tissue secrete clear watery alkaline juice that contains several enzymes which actually break down food into smaller molecules and these en enzymes include but not limited to trypsin and chymotrypsin which digest proteins amylase to break down the carbohydrates and lipase to break down fats into fatty acids and cholesterol so the endocrine portion or the islets of langerhans secrete insulin and other hormones so these are the two important portions where 
uh, you know, uh, pancreas can actually be uh, simply uh, physiologically divided. Anatomically, we all know that head, unseen process, body, and tail. And these are the most important portions which actually loop around the duodenum. And if you notice very carefully, there are various, uh, you know, uh, openings of the uh, pancreatic duct and uh, which may actually open into the common bile duct or separately open up into the duodenal papilla. There are multiple variations which are beyond our understanding, but for surgeons, it is very important, and especially endoscopic gastroenterologists, to understand that sometimes there could be separate openings of this duct, or sometimes accessory pancreatic duct can separately open. So just to kind of say that these are the lobules which we talk about as a small units where the endocrine and exocrine functions are done. This is actually the duodenal papilla where it actually uh, opens up. And so just you, can before that, pointer, you can use a pointer also at the left hand if you want. This will be a pointer. Uh, 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 okay, okay. I am I'm, 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 I'm not very great with okay. that, Tabesh. Let me work it out. No, but I'll, okay. I'll just enlarge so that probably... Uh, uh, is the screen getting enlarged? Are you able yeah, to... Yeah, it's enlarge getting enlarged. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So with this, actually, uh, this is where the summary is. And, and Tabesh, I would request you to please keep on giving a kind of live commentary at any point of time where you feel uh, it will be very happy to, you know, kind of put some facts. Okay, so okay that, sir. I will, I will add, the, uh, add to the thing you could call it. Sure. Thank you. So this is just an anatomy as a, as a recap for all of us. And uh, finally, the lipase, the enzyme which breaks down fats and fatty acids. So if you look at that, protein, carbohydrate, cholesterol, all of these metabolism are very delicately handled by pancreas. In fact, stomach uh, uh, does only kind of homogenization and bringing down the particle for the easy absorption of these enzymes. And duodenum is actually the workhorse or the major factory for breaking down all these complex compounds into uh, smaller molecules or breakdown products so that the whole of the enterus or the, uh, the, the intestinal juices can actually work well. So pancreas is actually the opening batsman for actual digestion and breaks down on all account. And hence the, the kind of complexity of the proteins and the enzymes mandate that it is very delicately addressed and it releases in response to the food and the complexity of the food. So uh, that's all about pancreas and it is mixed up with the uh, bile juices and the bile acids and bile salts to actually make it more potent and distribute it all across by reducing the surface tension. When we talk about normal pancreas on a contrast enhanced CT scan, this is very important that if you look at, this is actually the slice on which you can see the pancreas, the pancreatic body, the, the enhancing portion of the pancreatic or duodenal artery, then the pancreatic tail and a very nice, you know, outline. And this is very important, a clear outline because pancreas is a, is a reasonably solid structure, which is surrounded by gut intestine where there is a lot of air and on the back there are discrete structures and facial planes. So it actually always outlines. And the lack of this, uh, you know, differentiation, lack of this differentiation is actually uh, at the heart of understanding early pancreatic inflammation. So this is just for a kind of reckoner that this is where we look at the pancreatic body on the CT scan. Now, when we talk about uh, the case that we are going to kind of intersperse with, so this is a living case that we will be talking about as a scaffold around it, we will talk. This was a gentleman, 66-year-old uh, obese male, actually one of our uh, colleague's father. He's a known diabetic for last 12 years on multiple oral medications was otherwise reasonably well controlled except for a central obesity. His BMI was easily 37, 38, but he was a physically active gentleman who would move around, do all his activities well and independent. Had a right fever surgery for a fall around five years back. And apart from that, there were no significant surgical or medical history. He presented to a multi-speciality hospital, which was outside our hospital on 18th of August. And uh, this is where he was actually taken to, which was a good gastroenterology associated center. There he presented with simple one day history of fever, but three day pain of, uh, you know, uh, kind of diffuse origin in the abdominal area, in the center of the abdomen, which was characteristically associated with worsening with any kind of food intake, whether water, liquid or semi-solid and nausea and multiple episodes of vomiting. So, so this can was can this can short and simple presentation. Yes, please. Over to you. Yeah. Over yeah, to so you. Just one point. So, you know, pain is characteristic of pancreatitis. We all know that. But if you look at the literature, it says 5% of the patients may not have pain, 
And these patients are the ones who actually have very severe pancreatitis. So the reason for this is not clear. Very interesting, actually. I tried to look up the literature also. The cause is not clear why they don't have pain, but these patients have very severe pancreatitis. So, sir, just adding to, you know, as you... No, no, correct. Absolutely correct, Ramesh. So, in fact, atypical presentation of pain may probably mean that uh, the, the mechanism may be something else rather than only inflammation. When you have inflammation which is diffuse in origin, usually abdominal pain comes very early. But those people who don't have real pain may probably have some alternative mechanism, possibly. And uh, uh, maybe they, they might have, uh, you know, uh, 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 what is called not a constant, but a differential uh, intermittent release of enzymes. I, I am also not very sure. That's a good point that Tabesh has brought that absence of pain doesn't take away pancreatitis or severity of pancreatitis from the equation. Thank you. So here, uh, pain, nausea, vomiting, and a very small uh, episode of fever for a day. This was where we started with. And uh, we have broken down this case into this kind of a, of a timeline. If you look at that, uh, the, uh, the whole area, uh, the whole discussion that we will be talking about from eight to nine weeks that we will be talking about for this gentleman will be characterized by initial portion of, uh, you know, nearly two week duration where hospitalization, initial resuscitation and supportive care was done. After that came the third and the fourth week where organ dysfunction and local complications were manifested. From fifth and sixth week, we talked about the complications. We'll discuss about that, the secondary sepsis, and finally the late complications, uh, which will be the most important portion. So we were lucky enough to record all of these things at, at an evolving time frame for this gentleman and hence, uh, we will talk about the associated guidelines for various portions of care along with uh, the parallelly running case. And at any point of time, uh, you know, uh, anybody can interrupt us to ask about any specifics or details. So this is the beginning. Uh, this patient is admitted outside. As I told, no major illness except diabetes and obesity and abdomen pain uh, uh, for three days, uh, characteristically associated with food and only vomiting and one day of fever. He was admitted outside at this place and there the routine investigation was sent, which were along with two sets of cultures because of the fever. And he underwent a USG abdomen, which is a reasonably good choice in the beginning. And these were the reports, as we all see, a hemoglobin of 10.8, WBC counts 21,000, and 368, 368 patient counts, CRP was 237. A mileage, light is definitely elevated. I must tell you that the cutoff of a mileage and light was 60s and 80s. So nearly threefold elevation and above. And uh, LFTs, bilirubin 3.6, predominantly direct. SGOT 81, SGPT 37. I had specifically asked for alkaline phosphatase, but initial abbreviated LFT didn't have an LFOS. Only SGOT, SGPT and bilirubin was done outside, which later on we checked the alkaline phosphatase, which was never very high. It was in the range of 185 to 200, which was just above the uh, our normal range, which means there was some signs of obstruction, but not a very definitive obstruction. SGOT, SGPT were elevated. Creatinine was 0 0.9. Procalcitonin was 19.33 with a cutoff of 0 0.25. And this was the ultrasound done by an experienced sonographer who did define that there was edematous pancreas. So at this point of time, Tapesh, anything from your side? Any comments? Uh, any, any, Just any, that, any you know, the, the, the elevation of LFT in the setting of acute pancreatitis is twofold. Causes are two. One, there can be a gallbladder stone of shutting at the CBD. The second is uh, just because of the solar pancreatitis, the solar pancreas, uh, pancre uh, pancreas, it obstructs the ampulla of water and the CBD gets obstructed. So it could be either thing. And more commonly, it is actually the pancreatitis which gets swollen, which causes the infection of LFT. But the stone has to be kept in mind, the CBD stone at the ampulla of water. Perfect, perfect. Very nicely, very pertinent point. So anytime you see a rising bilirubin, this is important for all the listeners that we must have a complete liver profile. Because looking at the alkaline phosphatase, GGTP, are very, very important. And the pattern of the bilirubin elevation. So here, definitely direct bilirubinemia. SGOT, SGPT, not very, very high. So not, 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 a, not a kind of transaminitis, which is predominant. Because if the SGOT, SGPT were more than 10-fold elevated, that usually points towards an alternative mechanism. But anyways, alkaline phosphatase is usually the differentiator. And alkaline phosphatase, which is very high, with a bland kind of hepatitis and predominant direct bilirubinemia points towards a stone pathology. And that's why ultrasound will be very important. And then comes the next point about asking for ISVR dilatation. 
if you have intrahepatic biliary radicals which are dilated it very classically points towards extra hepatic obstruction if you have no signs of extra hepatic obstruction in the way that there is no elevation of alphos and isbr is not very dilated then you think about intrahepatic obstruction so that could be a very important differentiator it is very important to look at your lft in detail in any suspected case of abdominal pathology that gives you a lot of idea and for any doubt looking at the alphos the degree of SGOT, SGPT, and bilirubin elevation, and the kind of breakup, and alkaline phosphatase as a differentiator. And finally, if, if any doubt, look at the ISBR dilatation. So this uh, patient was very classically looking like a kind of, uh, you know, pancreatitis, where probably the stone has passed off. There was no obvious sign of any kind of a stone there. But the amylase, lipase, which were elevated, CRP being elevated, and the pain, very characteristic, was classical of gallstone or sludge-induced pancreatitis. Uh, sir, now, uh, sir, yeah. uh, you, your video is off. Can you put your video on? Yeah. But, oh, uh, you mean my video? Uh, my yeah, your, your video is off. You, can, you should put it on actually, sir. I, I don't know how I can do that, uh, Tabish. No, it will come at the left hand corner of the screen. Left hand bottom corner. Yeah, it's come now. It's there. But my picture oh, you can, is coming. Okay. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you, but my, just move my picture out. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but your picture, I... gone. your picture also goes when you move my picture. Okay, 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 fine. I, I'm okay. I, I'm, sir, I see. I see. Bolo. The other point here, sir, is about lipase and amylase. All our listeners should know that the severity of pancreatitis does not correlate with the rise in lipase and amylase. How, how much the lipase and amylase has risen? That is not a criteria for assessing severity of pancreatitis. Correct. Absolutely. So, Tabesh, moving on to the point where we will talk about the, the diagnosis as pancreatitis and how do we establish the diagnosis on a solid ground. What would be an appropriate imaging workup? Which lab parameter should be considered in the diagnostic process? How do different etiologies affect the diagnostic workup? Which course and what is the timing? So now we will talk about these areas when we have come to a clinical scenario. And I would be very happy if any of these comments will come in. So diagnostic lab parameters, cutoff value of serum amylase and lipase is normally defined to be three times the upper limit. The CRP values of more than 150 on third day can be a very important prognostic uh, you know, factor for severe acute pancreatitis. And I have, I have chosen these from the Dutch as well as the, you know, American guidelines. So the strength of the recommendations have also been kept in the bracket wherever it is applicable. So uh, a CRP level, which is very high on the third day is a very important prognostic factor. And I very strongly urge all the clinicians that if you have not done in the beginning, at least on the third or fourth day of your uh, di established di uh, diagnosis of pancreatitis, do a CRP which gives you a ballpark figure of where exactly do you stand on the severity. A hematocrit more than 44% is an independent risk factor of pancreatic necrosis. In our situation, if you have noted, it was 38. But if it is further rising to 44, definitely means uh, uh, you know, a possibility of pancreatic necrosis. But keep in mind that they will also get affected with the aggression of your uh, you know, resuscitation and the fluid. So it's not a, a standalone parameter, but important to note that. These give you a good idea on prognostication when you speak to the families. A urea level of more than 20 is an independent predictor of mortality. A procal is a very sensitive lab test for detection of pancreatic infection. But a word of caution over here. In very early, that is in the first two weeks, the variability or isolated value of procalcitonin will not be very important. In fact, the PCP, which is very high early on, can mean two important things. One, there may be an extra pancreatic focus of infection. Number two, any renal dysfunction will take away the procalcitonin value from your correction because the PCP rises as the as the uh, as the renal uh, you know kind of clearance uh, uh, starts getting affected, and that's why the reliability of PCP on a simultaneous renal dysfunction will be taken into account with every other picture. So don't take an absolute value of PCP important when the creatinine rise up. And here I will show that this gentleman had actually a rising creatinine later. So in the absence of gallstones or significant history of alcohol use, a triglyceride value above 1000 or 11.3 millimoles per liter indicates it as the most likely etiology. So always send a triglyceride level whenever you have a diagnostic doubt whether we are dealing with an alcohol or a gallstone induced pancreatitis. So these are just some important diagnostic lab parameters which give you a lot of cue and it is important to keep them at the back of the mind. When we talk about acute pancreatitis, the definition 
actually if you look at is abnormal activation of digestive enzymes within the pancreas due to inappropriate activation of inactive enzyme precursors or zymogens specifically trypsinogen so this is very important that pancreatitis means inflammation which means those digestive enzymes have to be activated and that is why when we are looking at those markers of amylase and lipase they are so important because they show that the uh, inactive enzyme zymogens and trypsinogen are definitely activated and the activation of these digestive enzymes lead to inflammation edema vascular injury leading to cellular death of the pancreatic you know cells and this is where exocrine and endocrine dysfunction will actually start following and when we talk about diagnostic criteria of ap it is actually the presence of two of the three following criteria and the three criteria are abdominal pain any biochemical evidence of pancreatitis and a characteristic imaging finding so you have to have either of the two of these three so as dr tapesh very clearly said if there is no abdominal pain but there is an elevated amylase lipase and there are certain characteristic findings either on an ultrasound or a ct scan or an mr ct they are very very diagnostic of pancreatitis so keep this in mind that if you have severe abdominal pain but not very high amylase lipase but a characteristic radiological finding or otherwise Uh, no characteristic radiological finding, but diagnostically elevated amylase and lipase along with pain, they will be pointing towards acute pancreatitis. Any any thoughts and comment at this point of time, uh, Dr. Tapesh? No, not uh, just uh, not really. Basically, like you said, trypsinogen is the main one which gets activated by whatever process is causing inflammation, and that leads leads to a cascade. The other thing is, you know, acute pancreatitis is surge, but uh, the overall uh, Uh, kind of uh, balance between the various cytokines is a little different from classic sepsis. You know, so all kinds of surges are there, but each surge is not the same. So just you know, uh, a few things. And the other thing is about triglyceride. Triglyceride anemia causing uh, pancreatitis uh, is actually needs to be treated with insulin, with heparin, and sometimes plasma exchange. Once in a while, you do get it. The commonest etiology is being alcohol and gallstone, and rule out hypertriglyceridemia, hypercalcemia, drugs. And uh, the uh, th these are very rare. So first is alcohol, also then sludge, sludge which is not so easy to pick up. Sometimes can be picked up with the uh, endoscopic ultrasound. Sludge is very common. Correct. We you are absolutely right. We'll come on that. There are certain features of that. But one important point that Dr. Tapesh said, trypsinogen. In fact, there was one of the bedside tests of urinary trypsinogen level, which was initially very popular. Urinary activated trypsinogen level. It was a dipstick test. very very classical in those scenarios where it is available it it obviates any need of blood test but again its sensitivity and specificity have been questionable and there are better and easier modalities so that's just for a historical fact now when we talk about pancreatitis acute and chronic pancreatitis looking at the timeline are very important because acute pancreatitis presents as an emergency and is a sudden onset of reversible inflammation while chronic pancreatitis is a progressive disorder ongoing inflammation and destruction which is happening insidiously and over a prolonged lifelong disorder with fibrosis and pancreas so that's something which we will refrain from discussion today just important that you must know that chronic pancreatitis is a, a distinct disorder and sometimes acute or chronic pancreatitis can also be a presentation but usually the pain not being very significant one of the causes is chronic pancreatitis or the pancreatic uh, uh, mass being shriveled down can actually reduce the pain or the perception of pain so this is what exactly dr tapesh was talking about the long laundry list of the causes but please see that 40% of the cases are gallstone induced either in the uh, gall bladder or or in the common bile duct so cole cholecystitis co calculus cholecystitis cole docolithiasis these are uh, constituting nearly 40% chronic alcohol use 35% uh, uh, of the cases so ethanol induced lastly 4% of the cases are ercp induced post ercp although the risk of ercp induced pancreatitis has been variously reported as 0.5 to up to 2% in certain cities but 4% of total pancreatitis can be a result of ercp so this is important to keep in mind and it is very very important that if you have been a part of any ercp you must underline the importance of life threatening pancreatitis as a complication because i have seen uh, a lot of times families coming back in great anguish that this ercp was done but we were never told that a pancreatitis can result because of it. 
So if pancreatitis is not there at the beginning and an ERCP is planned and then a pancreatitis develops, the family may take it very bad, especially if the pancreatitis is severe and with associated necrosis. Uh, lastly, medication, long list of medication, but three medicines need to be always kept in mind. Azathioprine, furosemide, and valproic acid. These are very important. Apart from that, a lot of cancer medications, specifically L-asparaginase and uh, estrogen, sulfonamide, tetracycline, pentamidine, and didanosine. They all have been variously associated in a lot of other drugs. But these three are commonly used and we must keep them in mind. Azathioprine, furosemide, and valproic acid. Uh, abdominal trauma also in uh, especially blunt abdominal trauma 1.5 percent of cases and then comes the rarer ones autoimmune disorder which is igg4 disease hereditary disorders hypercalcemia hypertriglyceridemia infection especially dengue especially in this season dengue and leptospira are known to cause in fact we had seen a lot of covid19 induced pancreatitis surgical procedures toxins scorpion bites and are known to have this tumors vascular abnormalities and a very important one the abnormalities of the pancreas where where sod is sphincter of odoid dysfunction pancreas division annular pancreas or what is called as a groove pancreatitis so these are probably the comprehensive list and they still don't encompass 20 percent of unknown causes so technically 10 to 15 percent of causes will still remain uh, you know idiopathic and that is also a very intriguing area so any, any other thoughts, Tapesh? We had discussed about that. Should I move on? So, so just one thing, sir, for ERCP induced pancreatitis, rectal endomethacin is uh, advocated in the literature. You are absolutely right. And unfortunately, uh, Tapesh, I also had the same opinion. In fact, Eulina statin also has been advocated for that. But a very strong review of literature just a few days back had said that rectal endomethacin doesn't really help it. So, so there are some non believers of that. But yes, okay. whatever benefit can happen, can happen in the first 24 hours of administering a good anti-inflammatory drug as a common sense. And it is worthwhile giving a good anti-inflammatory early on. And I personally feel, uh, uh, you know, Eulina Satin has shown to be beneficial in a long list of studies and it can be really considered. And I personally would like to give either diclofenac or there is one more drug, uh, I, I'm forgetting that, I think. That has been also shown very beneficial in post ERC. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So, other things are for the medications for the exams, etc. Which medications cause pancreatitis? There's a mnemonic called fast pace, F A S T P A C E, which covers the list that you have said. Oh, okay, okay, very nice. Now, so now, now I remember lexipafen, right? You are talking about lexipafen, which is also supposed to be beneficial in uh, in uh, in Harrison's principle of internal medicine. There is a kind of uh, there are four or five drugs, including prostacyclines, lexipafen, and a few other drugs, platelet activating factor four and all. I remember, but they are more theoretical for exam. Yeah, actually, it's it's very rare. Drug induced pancreatitis is very rare, but we should right. uh, cognizant of steroids. Should uh, steroids should not be Patient is having pancreatitis, you know, it's life-saving because steroids are okay. pancreatitis. So, thank you. And moving on to the pathophysiology, this is a little, uh, you know, crowded slide, but important. Uh, causative factors leading to pancreatic acinar cell damage, which causes biliary obstruction or acinar cell injury or defective intracellular transport, leading to release of intracellular proenzymes and lysosomal hydrolases and activate trypsin. And this causes interstitial edema, impaired blood flow, ischemia, and further pancreatic acinar damage, leading to finally a bevy of chemicals. Chymotrypsin uh, causing edema, calicrine kinin activation causing again edema and inflammation, elastase causing vascular hemorrhage and damages, phospholipase causing coagulation abnormality like DIC necrosis, and lipase is causing fat necrosis. So fat necrosis is at the heart of necrosis, inflammation, edema causing the, water, the dehydration, and hemorrhages because of those vascular damage. Finally, this is exactly which what we mean about the dreaded acute pancreatitis. So this is important. And uh, when we talk about our patient now coming back to the timeline, we move about to the important portions of resuscitation and the supportive care. So this is what, what was happening by the time. And now uh, when he was admitted at the outside hospital, he was kept nil per oral for one week. He was resuscitated aggressively with IV fluid. And I unfortunately could not get the details of the fluid that was given and this is very important we talk about that because probably this is the most important profile access for a poor outcome 
if you give aggressive IV fluid and hydration, it has been shown to be very, very beneficial. And uh, this is the time where early fluid resuscitation, but in a very balanced manner, would be important. We'll talk about that. Tapesh will talk about that. And uh, in view of the fever being persistent, even after a week and PCP very high, patient was started on antibiotics. He was actually already started on meropenem outside. We'll talk about that. And on second week, a contrast enhanced CT scan was done, which is on 22nd of August. So if you all remember, this gentleman had pain uh, practically, uh, you know, uh, practically eight or nine days back. And uh, this is actually the beginning of second week, which is the right time to do an imaging. We'll talk about that, which was very classical and proved that it was acute necrotizing pancreatitis. And we'll talk about that, but it is important to know that CT abdomen is not usually done for diagnosing pancreatitis. Rather, for understanding the severity and involvement, we'll talk about that. But this is the reason which I wanted to show that though the pain started practically on 15th or so, but the CT was done 22nd, which is correct. There was a very clear established diagnosis because of biochemical, abdominal pain and a characteristic finding on the ultrasound. So that was a good decision by the outside team not to over-investigate and give contrast, especially with dehydration and everything, and do it only after appropriate resuscitation. And that's where the sludge and microcalcaline gallbladder was picked up. Now, during this second week, patient had pain which was coming down. He was gradually feeling better. He also became afebrile after the addition of antibiotic. Now, that's where we will discuss about that, whether really meropenem helped or it was just fluid resuscitation and waiting it out that the fever settled down. His amylase and lipase were decreasing. There is no need to do a trending of amylase and lipase, but they had done it outside. And there was a gradual rise in creatinine with recurrence of fever by end of second week, that is the 14th week. And now this is the time where he comes to us. And before I open up the discussion, this was the point, unfortunately, where the outside hospital had suggested the family that now we have nothing to do except for wait out, take him home with an IV line and continue with antibiotic and uh, you know manage him with antibiotic at home which I personally feel is a disastrous advice unless patients are really financially you know, compromised, they can manage some, some kind of home critical care, which is becoming in vogue. But strictly speaking, any person with pancreatitis, which is severe and acute necrotizing in origin, giving them a advice to you know, kind of move out of a hospitalized institution is absolutely dangerous. So that was just to kind of tell that the patient was there for two days at home and as expected, he started having fever and decreasing urine output and, and he gets shifted to our center at this point of time. So this is by now 8th of September. So from 22nd of August, that guy had been kept in the hospital, probably discharged on the 3rd or 4th and was two days at home and again went to another center. From there, he was immediately shifted to us because of severity. We'll talk about that but we'll just take a small break at this point of time to talk about fluid resuscitation. Uh, Dr. Tavesh, anything that comes to your mind so far? No, sir, this, this is a very important slide. This fluid resuscitation is a very, very important slide. Please carry Absolutely. on. Absolutely. So there, here now we have understood that the mortality has been directly related to actually poor resuscitation efforts. And there is no other disease apart from trauma uh, that uh, fluid resuscitation plays such an important role. And that's pancreatitis. In fact, it has been shown, and in, in fact, we are guilty of giving 8 to 10 liter of fluid resuscitation in the first 24 hours sometimes. This was 20 years back when we were told that fluid resuscitation is very, very important to maintain microcirculation. And we didn't realize that actually that was the reason for worsening abdominal compartment syndromes later on. So aggressive but balanced resuscitation is very, very important. And this is probably where the art of intensive care comes We'll talk about that. But prevention of pancreatic necrosis by maintenance of microcirculation uh, is very important. Uh, data on amount of fluid needed to prevent necrosis or to improve outcome are contradictory. And the volume must be adjusted to the patient's age, weight, pre-existing renal and or cardiac conditions. It's not important to do a central venous pressure monitoring, but rather any of those dynamic measures rather than a static measure of fluid responsiveness. But more importantly, not just fluid responsiveness, the downstream markers of urine output, of the, your SCVO2, your warmth of the peripheries, the tissue perfusion. Apart from that, some of the static markers like IVC variability and other numbers that you use. Uh, it is not advisable to put invasive cardiac output monitoring lines unless the patient is really sick with multiple inotropic requirements, ventilatory requirement early on, which is very, very poor, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, prognostic marker. 
But early fluid resuscitation is definitely important to optimize tissue perfusion targets. Don't wait for hemodynamic worsening. Isochronic crystalloids are preferred in the initial half. Ringer lactate may be associated with anti-inflammatory effect, but the evidence for superiority over normal saline is again based on randomized trial. So a small break here, Tapesh, anything that you want to add or kind of highlight? Yeah, yeah. so very, very rightly and appropriately said, sir. Like uh, the trend is shifting uh, towards less fluids, uh, you know, a more conservative kind of approach in Panga debtors. So our students might ask, what is the evidence? And it's important for them for the exams also. So very recently, a trial has been published in NEGM or just a couple of months ago for the waterfall trial. They had uh, randomized 780 patients. And uh, these patients uh, were, you know, the one group was given fluids as usual, large volume. The other was given moderate uh, volume uh, decided by clinical parameters and without uh, hemodynamic monitoring. And what they showed was that uh, there was no increase in mortality and no increase in the development of severe pancreatitis. But the patients, the group which got a lot of fluids, that is large volume resuscitation, had 22%, uh, 22% of them had uh, fluid overload as compared to 6% in the conservative group. So the trend is moving towards a conservative kind of approach guided by some parameters, static uh, dynamic parameters or clinical parameters. And this, again, there's the latest guideline, you know, the latest guidelines published uh, in uh, pancreatitis have been by a French group, the French uh, European Society. And they've also said the same thing, that they do not advocate uh, large volume resuscitation. The evidence for large volume resuscitation is very weak. That just been going on and on. And the pendulum in all illnesses is swinging toward lesser fluids. So this is very rightly put and our uh, young fellows should realize that uh, some kind of a monitoring should be done, clinical monitoring as well as dynamic uh, monitoring to give fluids uh, to these patients. And the other thing is about ringer lactate. Like Sir said, the evidence is not very strong, but yes, there is some uh, trend towards ringer lactate being superior to normal saline. There are two reasons. One, ringer lactate reduces uh, intracellular acidosis in the pancreas and it also stabilizes trypsinogen. So just like he has mentioned, anti-inflammatory effect. So preferably give a lot of lingual lactate and some normal saline. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tabesh. Actually, my apologies. I, I could not put it across, but this was a trial by Madaria et al., which was published in NAGM. Very nice uh, article, which very clearly showed the risk of uh, you know overzealous resuscitation leading to fluid overload with aggressive you know, kind of resuscitation causing, uh, you know, no major change in local complication, but actually organ failures were higher with aggressive resuscitation to the tune of 7.4% as compared to 3% and 20.5% likelihood of fluid overload as compared to 6.3% in moderate uh, resuscitation. So, uh, you know, uh, I would urge all the people to go through this waterfall trial to understand how do you kind of tailor the fluid resuscitation for pancreatitis. And this is important, but at the same time, we don't need to, you know, under uh, you know, cut down the fact that uh, fluid resuscitation is a very key early pillar of care for pancreatitis and use your common fluid stewardship. So, Rose concept resuscitation, optimization, stabilization, and probably even an evacuation early on would be important. Having some dynamic and static components combined together and a very close loop review of your fluid goals and targets. So, moving on. This is exactly the difference between a severe versus a mild acute pancreatitis. In the lower column, when you look at that, a preserved neurohumoral mechanism and intact capillary circulation doesn't allow a systemic inflammation to worsen. There is very minimal fluid deficit, no capillary leak, and the patients usually don't develop any organ dysfunction. While when you talk about a severe acute pancreatitis, the neutrophil activation and free fatty acid release the dams, damage associated molecular patterns causing cytokine release, causing a lot of bloodstream endothelial dysfunction from the capillary leaking, causes three important facts. Lung injury because of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, shock because of myocardial injury and intravascular volume contraction, and acute kidney injury because of interstitial edema and tubular injury. So this is actually at the heart why do they develop distant organ dysfunction? In fact, we'll talk about the Atlanta scoring, which actually depends upon these three organs getting secondary hits in a severe acute necrotizing pancreatitis. 
this is very very important for everybody to understand what exactly is happening it's not just your aggressive fluid which is causing that but it is a disease and on top of it if you have a very overzealous fluid resuscitation strategy you may do more harm than benefit especially the glycocalyx rupture and uh, this is very important the balance personalized fluid therapy is still the most important thing coming to the most, most important portion about uh, the pain control this is very very important because when you look from the patient's perspective he is not impressed by the diagnosis or the mechanism that you have established he only wants pain control because this pain is really bad a boring dull a uh, continuous epigastric pain going to the back even to the spine as if somebody has been stabbed badly and he is just not cooperative half of the time this pain poor control is actually responsible for the uh, delirium that usually associates with that and that actually worsens the overall outcome so please take care of the control of the pain nsaid should be avoided commonsensically because of the worsening aki epidural analgesia is a very good alternative option because this pain lasts very long although there are not many people who are very very you know pro this i would say at least a pca should be integrated with every described strategy fentanyl morphine or dilaudid that is uh, uh, you know hydroxy uh, uh, you know codone so these are the various opioid based pain uh, relief measures the important thing is that uh, the hydroxy codone actually is better because it doesn't cause too much of sphincter of odi dysfunction but again uh, uh, you know abuse potential uh, you know preclude the usage for long i would suggest that optimizing paracetamol and using a multimodal pain relief is very very important so pca or an epidural analgesia with paracetamol uh, looking at the lfts if the lfts are not bad not crossing a 2 gram limit but can safely go up to 4 gram in a healthy adult who is not having a liver dysfunction especially hepatocellular dysfunction is very very important Uh, any suggestions over there, uh, uh, Dr. Davish, for the pain control? No, 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 no. That that's fine, sir. So uh, now we move to the next important part because early on, when the pain will settle and the fluid resuscitation is done, then your focus has to come to enteral nutrition. Because I must tell you, whatever people will say, a timely. I'm not saying early. I'm not saying late. A timely enteral nutrition will prevent gut failure and infectious complications. so in enteral nutrition is so deeply uh, you know uh, you know entwined with management of pancreatitis that the right moment you get a foothold you need to initiate enteral nutrition tpn definitely should be avoided unless you are talking about an associated major you know kind of malnutrition and it is crossed beyond 7 to 9 days and you are unable to reach any of the caloric or protein requirements even at the end of one week or enteral food route is absolutely not tolerated both gastric and jejunal feeding can be delivered safely and there is no particular preference of one over the other unless you feel that there is a lot of ileus and abdominal distension vomiting and nausea is bad and you are worried about the severe pancreatitis causing uh, destruction of the architecture of uh, you know the duodenum then probably a little earlier naso jejunal tube placement can be considered otherwise invariably a failure of repeated trials of naso gastric feeding or oral feeding should mandate a consideration for a naso jejunal over to you uh, tabesh any suggestions uh, yeah just that uh, you know feeding should be started as early as possible very rightly you are told entirely and uh, uh, the other thing is you know uh, advocated by espn at 7th day the, the patient should be by 7th day or at 7th day You should be getting uh, full calorie come out. That is very important. So if you enterally you cannot deliver even despite your NG tube, NG tube has failed. You put a nasal jejunal, it has failed. Patient is not tolerating. You have to go for TPN. But if you are giving TPN, you have to give at least some trickle feed because that is very important to prevent gut translocation, which is the cause of infected pancreas, the pancreatitis. That is very important to realize. And feeding is very important. We have to maintain the feeding by seventh day. you should be meeting full calories that those are the guidelines also by espn thank you thank you so uh, the other important controversial area uh, you will always be as an intensivist you will always be at the loggerheads with the gastroenterologist or the surgeon or any other clinician involved for uh, initiation of prophylactic antibiotics the evidences have very clearly shown that there has been no association in fact i would say a harmful association because of selection of more resistant bugs and the routine prophylactic antibiotics are no longer recommended for all patients with acute pancreatitis it's a grade 1a recommendation only for extra pancreatic infection or when you have a documentation of cholangitis they are the only two conditions 
where you are justified in initiating an antibiotic. And this is very important. You need to be very strong, irrespective of the PCP value, CRP value, initial, uh, you know, uh, initiation of prophylactic antibiotics should be very strongly discouraged. And there has been n number of studies which have shown that early initiation of antibiotics doesn't change the outcome. Yes, there has been a tendency in certain early studies which were done in the uh, in uh, 2007 and 2008 by, if I'm not wrong, Pelosi at all, who did show that the infected pancreatic necrosis kind of incidence comes down. But I can counter that with n number of studies which says that there is an increasing incidence of gram-positive enterococci as well as fungal infections later on by early initiation of antibiotics. And especially previously, there was a trend of broad-spectrum antibiotic like ciprofloxacin or maybe a ceftriaxone to be started. I strongly discourage that, and there is enough evidence to, uh, you know, stop that. Uh, Dr. Tabesh? No, nothing, sir. I very rightly said. And uh, one of the, the two reasons are, one, it will lead to development of MDR organism started early. Second, it will lead to fungal infection. So that is the downside. Go on. Excellent. So, and coming back to the imaging, very important uh, that uh, ultrasound should be a preferred uh, investigation uh, in the beginning to determine the etiology of acute pancreatitis unless it is very, very clear on the biochemical pain pattern. But nonetheless, ultrasound is a good beginning. It gives you a lot of idea. Excellent modality. Sometimes overlying gas, obesity, fat, all of these may not really allow you to look at the things. But invariably, a good operator would be able to give you the etiology much clearly with the possibility of a stone found either in the gallbladder or in the lower end CVD. And it also gives you a fair idea about the pancreatic inflammation and sometimes even about the vessels around the, uh, you know, vessel imaging and the ISBR dilatation. If any doubt exists, CT scan provides a good evidence of presence of absence of pancreatitis. All patients with severe acute pancreatitis need to be assessed with contrast-enhanced imaging or an MRI. But the timing would be minimum three to four days after the onset of symptom. Before that, doing a contrast-enhanced CT assessment may not be helpful unless there was a doubtful etiology, but otherwise try to figure it or delay it as long as four to fifth day after the pain initiation, if there is no diagnostic dilemma. And uh, that gives you a good idea and it should be always contrast enhanced to really understand the amount of necrosum. A non-contrast enhanced uh, one is uh, uh, harmful. And even if there is a suggestion of AKI giving appropriate hydration and then doing a contrast enhanced has not shown to worsen contrast-induced nephropathy. So uh, I would very strongly suggest optimization of fluid uh, and giving them pain relief optimization and then doing a contrast-enhanced CT scan on the fourth or fifth day to understand the significance or the severity of the pancreatitis. MRCP or ERCP should be considered to screen for occult common bile duct stones in patients with unknown etiology. But again, that is a 1C recommendation if you are unable to find out what is the cause. So, any any uh, any any uh, comments, uh, Dr. Tabesh? No, no, that's fine, sir. Just that uh, in renal failure, uh, you can hydrate and do a CT, but uh, if you are worried, MRI is just good enough. It also picks up the necrosis. So Absolutely. MRI... In fact, in fact, MR is supposed to be much more better in picking up the fluid versus the non-fluid component of necrosum. In fact, a couple of our gastroenterologists insist for doing an MR even if a CT is done before a drainage procedure is planned. We will talk about that because that gives you a good idea whether there is a liquefied component to remove because CT will not be able to really accurately distinguish that. And sir, not only that with MR, you know, even in renal failure earlier, uh, you want to be, uh, they used to gadolinium. But now there are much better contrast agents which do not worsen the condition, do not cause nephrogenic sclerosis. So MR is another op uh, option uh, with contrast in patients with renal failure. Absolutely, absolutely agree. So uh, moving on, uh, the the definition and the this is this exam. Uh, uh, the, the students must know uh, various criteria, classification systems, and scoring systems. So these are the classical three: uh, Atlanta, revised Atlanta, and the determinant-based classification. Uh, you can choose any one of them which you are comfortable with, but I would say, looking at the extreme right, the critical uh, acute pancreatitis is a very important uh, you know, definition which we must know, which is associated with infected peripancreatic necrosis and persistent organ failure. Now, this portion is very, very poorly understood by a lot of other clinicians because they look at the undulating course, patient looks better at the end of two weeks, and they forget that an ongoing organ failure like a kidney dysfunction, 
or a, a continuous need for oxygenation or a hemodynamic instability, even when the patient is fully conscious and sitting around, can be actually a critical acute pancreatitis. While mild, moderate, and severe are very, very obvious and understandable, but critical would be with a persistent organ failure and an infected pancreatic necrosis, both together. While severe acute pancreatitis may have one of the two, a persistent organ failure or infected peripancreatic necrosis, while moderate is usually with a sterile necrosis and or transient organ failure. While mild AP, no organ failure, no peripancreatic necrosis. So I would say a determinant-based classification is very important for all the budding intensivists to really know and keep in their mind and they should use these words while talking to the family and other, other, other clinicians. A critical AP is actually on the highest spectrum of mortality. When we talk about the severity guidelines, uh, it's very clearly shown that uh, revised Atlanta classification, determinant-based classification are similar in establishing the diagnosis and severity. And it is definitely the organ failure, which is persistent, which gives you a directly linked uh, mortality outcome. And who have persistent organ failure with infected necrosis have the highest risk of death. And a patient with organ failure should be admitted to an intensive care always. And now we uh, move into the third and fourth week of our patient's history. And this is actually how uh, it, it, it helps to you know, talk to the relatives very early on that these would be the stations which every patient with acute severe pancreatitis may land up with. And this is how uh, in our institution, we always make it a point that right from the clinical associate to the intensivist or to any other multidisciplinary meeting happen around these timelines so that the patients and the families are really counseled well for a long drawn battle with undulating cords and a lot of slippery areas. So we talk about the organ dysfunction now. So at this point now when he's with us, uh, this is third week into process and his CBC shows 43,000 count, hemoglobin 10, platelets are okay. Creat is 3.45 with a blood urea nitrogen of 77, very high. In fact, we were very worried that he may be heading towards dialysis. His urine output was very poor for 48 hours before he came to us. CRP was 209 and this we are talking at the end of uh, two weeks. Triglycerides, normal, calcium, low, 7.8 with an albumin, which was 2.8, 2.9. And vitals, 124 heart rate, BP was on noradrenaline, 0.2 micrograms. Saturation, 98 on 4 liters of oxygen with a respiratory rate of 25. And an ABG suggestive of a compensated uh, you know, scenario where the bicarbs were around 22 and TCO2, 32. Now, this is the situation in which he walks into our hospital. Doesn't look good. Tachypnic. Tachycardic, BP is maintained with a single vasoactive agent and he has a CRP which is high and already a creat which is high with very high counts and already having a course of antibiotic going on for last seven days of meropenem. So any any thought process at this point of time? Uh, no, 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 not that, just, just about calcium. So what is the cause of hypocalcemia and pancreatitis? So it's commonly believed is saponification, you know, that calcium binds to the release of uh, fatty molecules in the peritoneum, but that is always the case. What is actually more important is the serum albumin, which leads to a spurious hypocalcemia. And the third reason is there's often a hypomagnesemia in these patients, which suppresses PTH and leads to hypocalcemia. And if hypocalcemia uh, is, uh, you know, after looking at the albumin, corrected calcium is low, you need to correct it with IV calcium. So calcium has to be uh, taken care of. Sometimes it becomes really low. So, uh, thank you, Tavish, for that. And uh, this was the plain CT scan of the abdomen done because the creat was high. We didn't want to give any contrast. We had already had established diagnosis and one CT contrast was already done. Uh, uh, this was the CT scan that we saw and it was very clearly showing. If you look at the pancreas and you remember now the normal pancreatic outline that we discussed and look at the kind of smudging, heterogeneous areas with some air pocket close by, and, and, and practically practically no area which was spared from the head to the tail and a lot of variegated appearance and uh, you know a lot of fat standing around, which is something which is a very, very alarming sign. And, and it should be made a possible, uh, you know, every intensivist should make it a point to look at the CT images himself. Never rely on the radiologist's opinion because they may not really figure into account the clinical implications. And that's very important. If you have more than 50% of pancreatic involvement and this kind of a picture, this is disaster in making. Whatever people will say, whether it is infected or non-infected, but still 
it is a very very serious serious scenario number 2 looking at the possibility of ascites on the flanks and and the lower film the pelvic uh, you know slices and bilateral effusion diffuse fatty infiltration of the liver obviously anemia hypoproteinemia were very clearly suggested with the edema but this was a flag bonus collection without uh, you know uh, uh, you know any kind of differentiation in the borders and more than 50% of pancreatic involvement so this was uh, something which was very alarming and now we talk about a few scoring systems and identifying early on for this patient how do you communicate with the family about the possibility of mortality and poor outcome so uh, any, any suggestion at this point of time tapesh or should i move on no no just find the scoring system that important please tell me so bedside index of severity of acute pancreatitis is called bisap score it's very important very simple and it's really bedside you don't need anything except bun and the systemic inflammatory response syndrome age pure effusion impaired mental status now noted that it is actually drawing a lot of things from quick sofa where we are looking at uh, you know uh, the impaired mental status age and signs of inflammation are very important more importantly the blood urea nitrogen of being very high is a very early suggestion of intravascular volume depletion suggesting the very poor fluid resuscitation which has happened or despite appropriate fluid resuscitation a lot of endothelial dysfunction uh, coming back to age age has been historically shown to be very important marker because of associated uh, capability of uh, you know uh, fighting the disease and the inflammation pleural effusion very clearly means that there is a third spacing happening and it's a very simple space to look at third spacing beyond the pancreatic bed and finally uh, impaired mental status as we know that altered behavior is a very important cue towards uh, a, a disseminated inflammatory response and uh, uh, i think this summer summarized score of 3 to 5 points definitely shows that there is there is a much higher mortality anticipated in these people and this is like a snapshot test at the bedside so in this patient when we did that as you can see there was no impaired mental status but all other criteria were being met the bun was high 77 sers criteria were met age was more than 60 pleural effusion present so he had a four point score bisap score showing that there was easily a mortality rate of 22% to be presented at. now there is another very good score which we must keep in uh, practice modified marshall score to assess organ dysfunction again this is like a sofa score in a simplified manner but respiratory renal cardiovascular areas looked at and here if you notice that he was needing 4 liters of oxygen his pf ratio was not very great and his cvs uh, system was dependent upon a single uh, you know supportive measure and for a non ventilated patient his fi2 requirement was around 4 liters or 30% and this this was important because uh, this modified marshall score actually gives you an idea about associated organ dysfunction very early on in this patient the modified marshall score was 7 he has organ dysfunction and if you look at the respiratory renal and cardiovascular status all of them were involved and this was something which was much more accurate than a bisap score to tell about a very important likelihood that we are dealing with a serious patient Uh, coming back to the classical age old ransons criteria on admission versus a 48 hour late admission where we look at the hematocrit and fluid sequestration hypocalcemia hypoxemia increase in bun and base deficit again all of them talking about uh, you know ongoing uh, fluid uh, sequestration as a sign of organ dysfunction and uh, uh, it is important that it should be done at two different times and it actually gives you a better idea of the appropriateness of fluid resuscitation so this is important if everybody has looked at that and uh, uh, probably the most important parameter over there is fluid sequestration of more than 6 liters because that has been universally shown to be associated with poor outcome and a fall in hematocrit by more than 10% also means that there was a lot of third spacing happening so in this situation this was uh, as the patient was shifted from other center we did not have all the available reports we looked at the you know kind of change and from admission to later on there was a four point change and there was a predicted uh, mortality of 40% by this so again a bad marker uh, the age and the wbc counts on admission were really bad but later on the calcium and the arterial po2 being low were the additional points with increasing blood urea nitrogen and a hematocrit drop of more than 10% so very important that you need to look at these scores at different time frames this is finally the pancreas score and i like the most 
very simple acronym PO2 age neutrophil calcium renal enzyme albumin sugar with these four parameters the PO2 counts urea and LDH having the highest independent significant predictors of mortality and if you look at this our gentleman actually on the modified glasgow or this pancreas score didn't do very well his score was definitely more than 3 and uh, he he had a very high mortality prediction right on the day one this was 6 point more than 40% mortality on the pancreas scores the only good thing about there that the ldh was not very high and the glucose levels were not very out of control but rest every other parameter of albumin bun calcium wbc age and po2 were adverse so a bad marker to start with finally the ct severity score or the balthazar index which is something which is very very important and it has two different heads one ct finding of the surrounding collections and the uh, no pancreatic edema and the extra pancreatic changes plus fluid collections while the second is necrotic score if you look at the ct finding uh, you know edematous pancreas with mild extra pancreatic changes or severe extra pancreatic changes plus one fluid collection or multiple or extensive fluid collections so he would come in our patient will come in the category of 3 and uh, uh, you know a kind of uh, a necrotic score of more than 50% unfortunately we didn't give contrast the second time so even if i downgrade it to only edematous pancreatitis with extra pancreatic changes and not talk about, talk about the pancreatic necrotic collection in the head even 2 point plus more than 50% 6 point was an 8 score which is a bad one any severity index of 7 8 9 are really bad and 9 and 10 actually invariably respond to a more than 40 to 50 percent mortality. So, this was uh, reported by our team as 7 estimated mortality of 17, which I don't agree because when a clinician looks at that CT scan versus a radiologist, their assessment would be different. So, important that there was more than one fluid collection in phlegmon and more than half of pancreas involvement. It was still, I think, eight to nine points, but they still recorded as seven, which is not correct. I think eight to nine points was the real estimation of this Balthazar index. Uh, Dr. Tabesh, anything from uh, your yeah, point? So, uh, that I can move on with this. so just a few things. One, you very nicely shown all the scoring systems, uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, to distinguish uh, it uh, for the various systems from the Atlanta scoring system. So the Atlanta scoring system is the one which is being used most widely, but the drawback is that it gives the prediction at 48 hours. So if you need to predict at the outset, then you have to use the other scoring system which Sir has shown. And uh, initially also you need to some uh, make, make some kind of prediction. And the other thing is about the Balthazar score. So the Balthazar score is not now really considered as a scoring system for severity, overall severity, but rather for the development of local complications. So that, and the third thing is necrosis. You call it a necrotic pancreatitis when more than 30% of the pancreas is a necros and the necrotic uh, degree, that is the amount of necrosis does not directly correlate with severity. There is only a rough correlation. It is not necessary that if the pancreas is necros 60%, it will have a much severer course than one which is 40% necros. I agree, Tabesh. Very rightly said. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the degree of local complications would be very well assessed. But invariably, whenever you have both the ends, more than one collection uh, or a phlegmon and more than 50% pancreatic necrosis, you must you know, put your seatbelt on because this gentleman or this patient will definitely have a stormy course ahead and a long drawn process. So moving on, uh, our patient was shifted uh, you know, uh, to the ICU with right IJV central venous catheter. His last blood cultures were negative and he had already received meropenem. The blood cultures sent at our center from the CVC as well as the peripheral line grew enterococcus PCM with a differential time of 100 minutes. Just to kind of remind all our uh, friends that more than 120 minute differential time to positivity will mean that probably the center line was a source, but it was pretty close. I cannot straight away say that it was a CRBSI, but it could have been a generalized bacteremia with a secondary colonization in the central line. But it's a very close call and it could be either ways. But nonetheless, any bacteremia with pancreatitis is a dangerous kind of combination. So the central line was changed and antibiotics were escalated. We'll talk about the antibiotics later on. A nephrology reference was taken, albumin and diuretics were started, and gradually the creatinine and CRP started decreasing and patient became afebrile. So I'll talk about this, but just to give you an idea that this was where he was with a line, he had gone home, he had come back with shock and persistent renal dysfunction. There is a, so always remember whenever a pancreatic patient comes at, at every interval, whenever there would be a surge of sepsis, 
please go back to your sepsis protocol, get the cultures drawn, look at the lactates, start the appropriate antibiotic, looking at the potential pathogens, and keep widening your thought process about the focus of infection and the site. So with this, uh, so so are, just want to clear, just want to clarify that so the creatine has started falling. So what is the cause of the elevated creatine? It was so this is yeah very very rightly said. I think this was a combination of both uh, the severity of inflammation, the the inappropriate fluid resuscitation, and the degree of inflammation. So many times, even with the most appropriate IV fluid and optimization, you will still have a renal dysfunction. And I think the underlying twelve years of diabetes must have definitely predisposed him with a poor nephronal mass and kind of his effective GFR when we calculate back for his age and weight and obesity would not have been too great to start with. May have been 45, 50 to start with and uh, any, any kind of insult would have pushed him down. Though optimization and with time and the contrast which was given before, all of them could have contributed. But his persistent other organ dysfunctions were very clearly showing that it was more of severity of pancreatitis than then really something very easily modifiable factor. Right. So moving on, uh, this was the local complication phase that we are talking about. He was in the third and fourth feed. He was already, uh, uh, you know, going on, on some oral feeding, which was just kind of being uh, tolerated intermittently. He had become afebrile 48 hours after the change of antibiotic. His procal came down to 0 0.59 from 19.33 on admission, which is a very important way of looking at the appropriateness of antibiotic or, or or what is called reversal of an extra pancreatic focus of infection. So I think a serial procal measure is the more important marker than an isolated value. And uh, this is something whenever you deal with an abnormal procalcitonin level should be kept in mind that, uh, that there is also a therapeutic indication of fall in procal by more than 80% as an appropriate antibiotic response or a good source control, and sometimes even, even as a guide towards de-escalation of antibiotics. So this was uh, how things moved on. He still had complaints of persistent abdominal pain and intermittent vomiting. He started having in the fourth week low-grade fever, and he had to be kept nil by mouth at this point of time. He underwent a repeat contrast enhanced CT scan, practically two weeks after now from the admission. And this is where we so the, are, there is uh, no organ failure. There is no organ failure. There is no organ failure here, sir. No, no, no. So I'll tell you, uh, Tabesh, I'm, I'm going in the say for the sake of timing. This gentleman continued to be on HFNC with you know intermittent NIV for right. the whole entire period. He would he was actually thought to be intubated at two or three intervals by my colleagues. And I was very worried because I was worried that if he gets intubated, he may kind of hemodynamically crash and the whole outcome can change. But he was neurologically fully conscious, cooperative and a tough man. And uh, he would he would kind of do well with intermittent NIVs and HFNCs. And his PF ratio was never below 150. Will always be between 150 to 250. And his respiratory rate actually had settled down to less than 22 uh, most of the time except that he would have sometimes a little acidotic pattern. And there was a debate always going on that should we intubate, but he would always, you know, kind of improve with even a short trial of NIV and would look good. And I, 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 can, I can actually uh, have a good discussion on that, whether a preemptive aggressive intubation would have been very, very helpful and relieving a lot of things, or probably that could have been, uh, you, know, uh, you know, would have a cascading effect and he would have probably... Uh, become hemodynamically unstable, but he was always having two organ dysfunction, creatinine as well as uh, the, yeah, the, the that PSA was study. that was what I wanted to do. Okay. Hemodynamics he became better after a few days. His inotropes got tapered off, and he was looking much more comfortable. In fact, at times he would sit upright, talk to the family, would be mobilized edge of bed, but he was he was still not really very very strong to come out of the bed and walk around, and he had intermittent complaints, GI complaints. So. This is a CT scan on the fourth week. Now here, when you look at, there is something which is very, very different than what we saw before. There was a clear cut air spec, air pocket over there around the head of the pancreas, 70% necrotic area with multiple air foci within the collection as a new finding. And that was suspicious of an abscess formation, two small loculated collection in the left retroperitoneum. And there was moderate ascites at this point of time. So, this is how he has been evolving with us. Some Sometimes acute organ dysfunction kind of settling to some extent, tolerating some feed, 
looking better, but again kind of worsening at this point of time. This is now four weeks plus. So at this point of time, I'll just take a small detour and talk about the follow-up imaging guidelines and we come back to the case. In severe acute pancreatitis with a CECT index of more than or three, a follow-up CT scan is indicated seven to 10 days after the initial CT scan. This is the guideline, although this is not hard and fast. This is only recommended only if the clinical status deteriorates. So a mandatory uh, follow-up CT scan is not required if the patient is clinically doing very well. But if a patient is clinically not well or doesn't continue to improve or an invasive intervention may be planned, a follow-up imaging guideline should be done. And that was the reason why we did this follow-up CT scan. So with this, uh, we decided at this CT scan that we need to do some intervention. So now, Tapesh, any suggestions so that we will unfold the case further? What do you feel at this point of time would be your approach? Actually, sir, you know, the, the guidelines are now moving towards a conservative approach for infective pancreatic necrosis unless the patient deteriorating and uh, try antibiotics and try to manage with antibiotics. If he continues to deteriorate, then you have to intervene. Otherwise, right now, what the guidelines uh, generally recommend is to give antibiotics for four weeks and let the situation stabilize and then it required intervene. I, I completely agree. Less is more in pancreatitis. At the same time, when you have air coming into the pancreatic bed, majority of the people actually uh, concur that some kind of approach should be done to at, at least exteriorize or have an access for a future retroperitoneal access mm -hmm. and probably escalation or step-up approach. So I think you are justified if your patient is not doing well despite antibiotic change and conservative approach, which was done. Actually, three rounds of antibiotic change has already happened by this time. And he has his PCT coming down and despite that worsening and especially intolerance to feed and abdominal distension. And there was a point where he never went into intra-abdominal hypertension, but his abdomen was definitely always distended and he was not tolerating feed. With this CT, we called an intervention radiologist and the uh, gastroenterologist, everybody who agreed that this is time for some kind of an insertion of uh, a device to drain out some uh, liquefied component. And a left retroperitoneal pigtail within pancreatic collection was inserted and right pigtail inserted into the ascites. So this was actually what we did. And if you look at that, this is how we have actually kind of placed those catheters. And these are the motion arti the artifacts because of the drain. And here, if you see very carefully, there is a drain over here for the ascites. And this is actually the pigtail, which is there exactly in the retroperitoneal area to drain, if you see the intestines, which are so diluted, volvulic conivents, and the abdomen completely distended, this is the previous, you know, kind of implant, and this is the uh, uh, the pelvic uh, drain. Uh, any any uh, passing remarks? Uh, no, any no, not at all. Please. So indications for percute endoscopic drainage, as Dr. Tabesh very clearly said, if you look at that clinical deterioration with signs of strong is suspicion of infected necrosis is an indication for an intervention. So rightly said, unless the patient is clinically deteriorating, you should try to avoid. After four weeks after the onset of disease, ongoing organ failure without sign of infected necrosis, ongoing gastric outlet, biliary or intestinal obstruction due to a large wall of necrotic collection, disconnected duct syndrome, symptomatic or growing cirrhosis, and after eight weeks, after the onset of disease, ongoing pain or discomfort. So this is important. All the listeners that from the third and the fourth week, uh, third to I think, uh, you know, uh, eighth week, you are going on with the kind of signs of infected necrosis with clinical deterioration. And any of these growing symptomatic cirrhosis or signs of gastric, biliary or intestinal obstruction due to a large walled, uh, you know, necrotic collection. And after eight weeks, any ongoing pain, discomfort, or physical pressure would warrant that. And that's a grade 1C observation. So I think this is very clearly laid down the indication for percutaneous endoscopic drainage of pancreatic collections. In patients with asymptomatic fluid collection or no necrosis, no immediate intervention required. Even in patients with severe pancreatitis and infected necrosis or persistent fluid collections, percutaneous CT-guided aspiration or surgical debridement is required in these patients, a minimally invasive approach is preferred. So even if you are pushed in any kind of unstable patient where you are thinking a non-surgical approach is preferred and collected fluid should be examined by gram stain and culture to determine the most appropriate antibiotic, this is needless to say. And uh, the intervention in gallstone-associated pancreatitis will be different. And this is just where I would take a small detour because those patients who had had gallstone pancreatitis, their Cholecystectomy is also something which we always talk about. 
But please understand, in our current patient, cholecystectomy cannot be performed with necrotizing acute pancreatitis until inflammation has decreased and fluid collections are no longer increasing in size. Please understand that. Apart from that, in usual stable gallstone pancreatitis, cholecystectomy within 48 hours of presentation can shorten the patient length of stay if they are stable enough. And I'm not talking about necrotizing pancreatitis. Uh, ERCP with sphincterotomy may decrease mortality. And this is very clearly shown compared to no sphincterotomy in patients with gallstone associated pancreatitis. So if you have cholangitis, that's the indication for ERCP. And at that point of time, sphincterotomy can reduce a lot of uh, back pressure changes. And a Cochrane review has shown that statistically significant decrease in complication rates uh, uh, in severe gallstone pancreatitis. Otherwise, doing these interventions will not make a difference. So I would suggest any gallstone pancreatitis which is severe and associated with cholangitis, an early ERCP would be important. So uh, a break over here, a uh, lot uh, of the page, any suggestions, any, 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 any kind of uh, thought process? No, carry on, sir. So this is again another AGRI tool, the appraisal of guidelines for research and evaluation, and uh, which very clearly says that emergency ERCP indications, as we spoke about, acute gallstone pancreatitis with cholangitis or biliary obstruction for emergency ERCP. This is a grade 1A recommendation. For percutaneous or endoscopic drainage, percutaneous or endoscopic drainage can be chosen when there are signs of necrosis or pancreatitis in the clinic if there is a strong doubt. So that is something which they have spoke about, but everybody can differ. Sometimes people would not want to intervene if the patient is clinically doing well. And I would prefer that option rather than only doing a drainage just because there is a pancreatic necrosis. So now coming back to our case, after the pigtail insertion, the samples were collected from both sides and sent for culture. And this is where we grew carbapenem resistant CRKP, Klebsiella pneumonia. And he was started on Zavicefta plus Astronam. And uh, after this, actually the patient started becoming a little better. He had complaints of dominant discomfort and nutrition was being hampered. So a nasojejunal tube was inserted at this point of time. Uh, uh, any, any queries, any, uh, any comments? Uh, Sir, so just uh, you got the cultures positive. So earlier now there was this uh, role of CT guided FNAC into the pancreas Correct. to uh, find out what is going on, what bacteria. But this has Correct. been a now, we don't now do CT guided dependency of the pancreas for two, three reasons. One, a lot of times uh, this is uh, negative, even if there is a spin, and that, that does not lead to de escalation, right? So, that is one reason. Second reason is there are some incidents of complications, you know, you perforate the abdomen, etc. So, now everybody should know CT guided dependency to uh, collect cultures and you know, make a diagnosis of bacterial infection in the pancreas is not recommended. So I completely agree that a routine CT guided uh, sample uh, kind of collection to choose about the antibiotic is what the West had kind of given in some guidelines. I think in our country that can actually convert a sterile necrosis into infected necrosis. So every attempt at doing this just for the sake of diagnostic or starting antibiotic would be fraught with introduction of infection. So I would strongly recommend not to do that. But if you have to do it, then the samples must be taken for appropriate antibiotic kind of tailoring. So this is where we stand now. The NJ tube is in place. The pigtail is over here, which is actually draining. And if you notice, it has slowly moved out, but still it was draining every day, 100, 200 ml. And the, and the lower pelvic drain is also in place. So this is our guy getting one and one more invasive or semi-invasive procedures going on. And if you can look at the abdomen, the fat, the intestines, marginally settled as compared to before and he's already freed and if you look at the lung also the shadows were looking much better and there was always a gastroparesis and I think this was justification for using an NG tube he starts feeding and uh, he looks much better at this point of time so again coming back to the feeding and acute pancreatitis as we spoke about who require prolonged bowel rest uh, they can be given traditional uh, parental nutrition but I'm not very pro for that a meta-analysis demonstrated that NJ nutrition resulted in fewer infections, decreased surgical intervention, shorter hospital stay, without change in complication or mortality rates. A Cochrane review showed that enteral nutrition had lower rates of complication. NJ and NG have similar safety and effectiveness profiles. So this is, again, uh, uh, coming back to the guidelines for infected necrosis. Antibiotics are always recommended to treat infected severe acute pancreatitis. However, the diagnosis can be challenging. And uh, due to the clinical picture, 
uh, we may not be able to really differentiate between infections and inflammatory status. And here, probably a, a serial procal values can guide, but I would not recommend initiating antibiotics based on PCP. Your tailoring or kind of, uh, you know, uh, what is called downgrading the antibiotics can be associated with PCP and especially the serial measurements. And a CT guided fine needle aspiration, as we spoke about, can be helpful, but is no longer in routine use as spoke by Dr. Tapesh. I will move on to now the early complications. We are moving on to the fifth and sixth week. And after that, we'll talk about others. These are the complications. If you look at the cardiovascular collapse, respiratory failure, renal failure were early on. Now comes the GIZ bleeding, BIC, visual disturbances. And this is a very nice term, visual disturbance called Putscher's retinopathy. It's a very important thing. And in fact, change in mental status. I don't know whether a lot of you will be aware there is a particular entity called pancreatic encephalopathy. And finally, metabolic acute fluid collection of pancreatic necrosis. So these are the uh, list of bevy of complications that can happen. In our patient, three have already happened so far. Let's talk about what happens next. So patient was so, started so, on... So just, just, I would like to just say one, a couple of things, sir. If you would do it the last, can you go to the last, last yeah, 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 please go, uh, please, please yeah. go ahead. So, sir, you mentioned Porsche's retinopathy, very interesting complication, rare, and it occurs due to its sudden blindness, which can occur sometimes, and it is due to fat emboli to the retina. Then you mentioned about pancreatic encephalopathy. Again, I have seen, I have not seen Porsche's retinopathy, but pancreatic encephalopathy does occur, and it occurs because of a couple of reasons. One, because of cytokines uh, going and hitting the brain, just like septic encephalopathy. Second reason is that often these patients are alcoholics and they can go to alcoholic withdrawal. And third is that they have, they, you know, they have prolonged uh, nutritional support. So they can have thymine deficiency leading to vernix. So these are some of the uh, causes of uh, pancreatic encephalopathy. Now coming to cardiovascular collapse. So the, the hypotension, you know, generally should reverse in 48 hours, but it does not often in pancreatitis. It goes on. And there are four or five reasons for hypotension in pancreatitis. One, that there is vascular leakage and have vasodilatation because it is SIRS. Second, uh, there's a release of viso, uh, vasoactive substances from the pancreatic inflamed tissue, which again leads to vasodilatation. Third, they can be bleeding in these patients. Fourth, they can be myocardial uh, dysfunction. So these are some of the causes of hypotension. And if hypotension is persisting beyond 48 hours, it's better not to just keep loading with fluids. Use NORAD just and try to use some tool for assessment. But the early use of NORAD with lesser fluids is better than rather going on with fluids and fluids because hypotension does persist beyond 48 hours in severe pancreatitis. And the fourth thing is renal failure. Now, you know, uh, we ha the, it has been advocated to use hematocrit and your blood urea as a marker for fluid resuscitation. But at the same time, one should realize that the patients who have severe pancreatitis may develop ATN within the first 24 to 48 hours itself. So if you look at just the urea, and uh, keep giving fluids and uh, seeing that the urea is not uh, uh, coming down because it is in ATN would be fallacious. So some of the features about the complications. Perfect, perfect. I think that is very well uh, you know, summarized. And uh, now we talk about our patient who is on NJ2 feeding, tolerating the feeds well. He became afebrile after 72 hours of the change of the antibiotic. Daily drain output and curve was monitored. Patient was doing well. And uh, now this uh, person is actually uh, 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 moving on to the sixth week. And he now develops sudden hypotension with drop in hemoglobin. His NJ tube, which was inserted with revealed coffee ground aspirate, you know, started on pantoprazole infusion and kept NBN. And uh, this is exactly on 17th of October now that this gentleman undergoes uh, gastroscopy and uh, multiple longitudinal discrete ulcers covered with white slough which was seen in this angle region. The NJ tube was there. The end of the procedure, discrete corporal ulcers. Luckily, there was no active bleeding, but blood transfusions were given. Uh, patient underwent GI scopy, corporal ulcers, and no evidence of recent GI bleeding was found over there. And the patient again started to slowly stabilize. But this was another of the complications which I wanted to highlight of GI bleed. This could be because of multiple reasons of stress ulcer, etiology, clinical feature, risk factors have been studied. And the majority of these patients had antecedent history of interventions, but usually mortality is higher in patients with, uh, you know, uh, GI bleed, which was not due to hemorrhage, due to sepsis and related complications. And this gentleman has actually no other ERCP or something performed. This was 
specifically because of prolonged sepsis, use of vasoactive agents, underlying renal dysfunction, and what is called as uremic coagulopathy and other complications. So this gentleman was actually heading towards more and more problems. And this was just one more to add on. Any uh, thoughts over there, Tapesh? Please carry on. So gradually, this patient's condition again improved after blood transfusion and the NJP. The hemoglobin was again stabilized, decreasing CRP, no fever. Again, hemodynamically stable, drain output persisted. He was practically draining 60 to 100 ml of mucky drain from the left uh, you know, retropancreatic collection. And from the acidic fluid, sometimes it may stop, sometimes it may increase, but there was not much of improvement. In the first few days, there was seven to 800 ml of pancreatic, uh, you know, not pancreatic, acidic fluid which came out which definitely didn't have very, very high lipase or uh, mileage levels. So it was not coming from the pancreatic, uh, you know, kind of duct disruption, but there was just a reactionary ascites which was drained out. And after that, only one drain was persistently draining 50 to 70 ml every day. And it was uh, like a mucky fluid, which initially was 300 ml. And that was probably where there was an immediate resolution of hemodynamics. And he started looking much better. He was actually asking for food, looking much better. We made to walk him in the ICU. And this was the time where we thought that we are turning the corner. He's already on the sixth week. Uh, and uh, apparently there is an adage that if your patient with severe acute pancreatitis survives 60 days, it's unlikely that he may die because of pancreatitis and its complications. But I think that's far from true. So now we are moving on to the seventh week where the late complications and secondary sepsis will come in. And this is where I would like to highlight the problems of late complications, where the dangerous ones comes in where there are pseudocyst formation, uh, pseudoaneurysm, perforation, obstruction, fistulization, infection, including abscess and infected necrosis. And if you look on the other side, this is the most important way, you know, understand based upon the Atlanta guidelines and the CT images. And let's look at one, uh, one at a time. So APFC is acute pancreatic fluid collection. If you look at the fluid collection over here on the, on the left-hand side, they usually develop in the early phase of pancreatitis, do not have a well-defined wall homogeneous, confined by normal facial pains, multiple, most acute fluid collection remains, remains sterile and usually resolves spontaneously. So our patient had an APFC in the beginning, uh, just when we go by uh, with the definition, with the pancreas, with necrosis to start with. And then this can evolve into either a pancreatic pseudocyst or an acute necrotic fluid collection. So when we talk about ANFC, this is where uh, inhomogeneous areas kind of evolve. If you look at comparison, and there is some portions where there are necrosis, very clearly seen on a contrast enhanced CT scan. And this usually happens after the first four weeks, which variable amounts of fluid and necrotic tissue and may be associated with disruption of the MPD, main pancreatic duct. When we compare this with a pancreatic pseudocyst, which is a very, very well-organized, well-defined wall and containing essentially no solid material. Occasionally, it may be partly or wholly intrapancreatic, Diagnosis can be made usually on the morphological criteria. So pancreatic pseudocysts usually evolve from APFC if the amount of severity and necrosis is less, while ANFC generates from APFC if there is a lot of necrosis and damage happening. And finally comes the WON or WOP involved of pancreatic necrosis or WON, which is necrotic tissue contained within an enhancing wall of reactive tissue mature encapsulated collection of pancreas and a peripancreatic necrosis with a well-defined inflammatory wall. And this maturation actually, not four, takes sometimes six to eight weeks after onset of necrotizing pancreatitis. So these are the four terms which have been replaced by the other phlegmonas and other terms which were used. And these are the revised Atlanta guidelines for the labeling of all the local complications and fluid collections. Uh, Dr. Dabesh, any suggestion? No, no, fine, sir. So these are the four terms we should use now. The other terminology has been done away with. This is what you have to know. Pseudocyst, we spoke about that. They are usually connected with the pancreatic duct system. Yeah. Supportive medical care, drainage procedures, percutaneous surgical endoscopy can be thought about. This is the easier one to deal. They usually are not lined by any epithelium, but there is a wall of fibrous tissue and they are otherwise much more organized collections. When we talk about pancreatic cirrhosis, there could be hemorrhage inside or splenic infarction, rupture of the cirrhosis, infections can occur inside after therapeutic or diagnostic manipulation and a large cyst in the pancreatic head region can actually cause obstruction of uh, CBD and even portal hypertension. So acute portal hypertension can also be evolved because of massive pseudocysts compressing on those uh, venous drainages.
GI complications in acute pancreatitis, the, now the dangerous ones, the vascular and the non-vascular. When you talk about the dangerous GI complications, there are two. Both vascular means pseudoaneurysm or active contrast leak or venous means acute thrombosis of splenic vein, superficial, uh, superior mesenteric vein or portal vein or other collaterals could be vascular. Non-vascular actually based upon what we spoke about, collections, pseudosis, acute necrotic collections and world of necrosis. And depending upon the duration and nature of collection, there could be bowel complications, including uh, perforations and pancreatic fistulas. So these are the two major categories of GI complications in acute pancreatitis. And now we talk about what would be the times when you really have to consider open surgery. So when you look at the conservative treatment of intra-abdominal hypertension, so when you have uh, you know, a rising intra-abdominal pressure or abdominal compartment syndrome, which is associated with decreasing urine output or a kidney dysfunction or other organ dysfunctions, then a surgical decompression and laparotomy are effective means. And this is again a C level of evidence because the benefit in these procedures are definitely not very, very well established because they are very catastrophic kind of situations. And a guideline held that patient with an IAP, intra-abdominal pressure more than 20, uh, where medical treatment is ineffective and accompanied by new organ dysfunction, an open abdominal drainage would be considered. So here, any uh, thoughts? Because it's a controversial area, but still, Dr. Uh, Tabesh, anything you want to say? No, no, sir, definitely controversial, but the West is actually more, they do go in for all this. But you know, maintaining these patients with the open abdomen in our country is itself a problem. So I think in our country, we generally tend to manage uh, conservatively. And uh, if you manage intra-abdominal hypertension well conservatively, you can manage it. You know, you can bring down the pressures. So in fact, IAP, whenever it develops, the most important thing is there is an IAP society which has kind of laid down very clear guidelines. It is important to measure the intra-abdominal pressure from the, you know, uh, uh, from the established ways like advisor or maybe, uh, you know, what is called as using the... Uh, uh, three-way, you know, Foley's catheter with inflammation, uh, with in installation of fluid, so that it gives you a reflection of the pressure. But again, the whole point is all conservative approaches at reduction of the IIP should be first tried out, and like like including you know uh, head low position, uh, relaxation paralysis if the patient is already intubated, some kind of uh, decompression of the drains, and finally coming even about you know rectal kind of tubes, and uh, you know allowing all these uh, clarities to happen. Probably that would be one of the most important marker. Uh, and uh, if despite that patient's abdominal pressure is increasing, then probably these, as Dr. Prabesh said, a dangerous, uh, you know, Bogota bag, open zipper, and keeping the abdomen open and putting, you know, uh, those kind of, there have been a lot of uh, intervening uh, kind of uh, some uh, implants which have been defined. Some people have even used plain plastic, you know, kind of keep those uh, abdomen open but actually prevented from any kind of external infection, but they are disastrous and probably should be done under supervision of a good trained laparoscopic or a good GI surgeon who should be monitoring this. And uh, uh, they are usually uh, very perilous situations. But indication for surgical intervention has been defined very clearly as these four or five indications. And I would say bleeding and perforation are the two grade one indications. When we look at a continuum in a step-up approach, after percutaneous or endoscopic procedure have not failed, uh, have failed, abdominal compartment syndrome, acute ongoing bleeding where endovascular approach is unsuccessful, bowel ischemia or necrotizing cholecystitis during acute pancreatitis, bowel fistula extending into peripancreatic collection and bowel perforation and obstruction. So all dangerous uh, outcomes, which all dangerous outcomes uh, probably which are uh, responsible for any disastrous or what is called uh, a desperate surgical intervention. And the timing of surgery and surgical strategy, postponing surgical intervention for more than four weeks is mandatory. But only in a rare situation of a bleeding or a perforation, you can go in early on. Uh, in surgical strategy, percutaneous drainage as a first line of step, step up approach delays the surgical treatment to a more favorable time and allows a complete resolution of infection in 60% of patients as the recommended first line of treatment and minimally invasive techniques like ward, video assisted retroperitoneal debridement in less operative, in less post-operative new onset organ failure, but require more intervention. So transgastric, endoscopic, necrosectomy, or video assisted retroperitoneal drainage, or ureteroscope inserted ones. And probably there are a lot of robotic assisted ones that people are trying. And even, uh, you know, uh, uh, internal orifices based like endoscopic ones through transgastric approach have been kind of discussed or EUS guided approaches. So 
they are the ones which are a lot of evolution and this is very very specialist area probably you need to call for help at this point of time and involve both interventional radiologist a gastroenterologist and a gi surgeon who is trained to do these a regular gi surgeon will definitely back off and based upon his expertise he may or may not take a viable opinion or, or an option so any suggestion at this point of time uh, no, no not, not fine sir absolutely tell me now uh, we will uh, actually uh, and uh, believe me this this is actually a, a real case which has happened and i don't know this was probably god sent so that this discussion can actually move in this uh, in a real case scenario which is happening in an icu so now this is early seventh week patient again had a complaint of abdominal pain and there was a change in color of the drain output sanguineous drain was present in a large quantity into the uh, drainage catheter and he had to be taken up thinking about a kind of bleeding from the pancreatic bed this drain is coming from the retro uh, peritoneal drain this was the blood clot which was coming over there hemodynamic instability drop in hemoglobin of 4 grams patient is unstable doesn't look very good he had to be urgently shifted for a ct angiogram at this point of time and he is he is definitely looking acidotic and this is the ct angiography remarkable for a ex extra vasation of contrast so this was a remarkable leak of a pseudo aneurysm arising from the splenic artery with hemorrhage within the infected necros pancreatic collection the drainage catheter was seen to course through this collection and that was the reason why the clots were coming out if you can see at this point of time it was a completely disrupted pancreatic architecture and there was uh, this active contrast which was leaking out and it was a disaster scenario we had an ir interventionist who had actually been able to do some embolization and it appeared that the patient had partly stabilized he was shifted for dsa with embolization intubated during the procedure selective embolization of the branches of splenic artery and pancreatic or duodenal artery were done patient received multiple blood and blood products he was shifted back to the icu on high vasopressor supports but uh, his hemodynamic stability was not very very kind of persistent he would hold on for a while and again kind of de escalate and he was developing acidosis and uh, decreasing urine output so any thoughts at this point of time dr tapesh No, no, sir. There can be multiple causes for hemorrhage, and pseudo aneurysm is one of them. GI pancreatic patients can bleed in it. So I think, uh, with the interest of time, uh, for uh, I think we have fifteen more minutes. And throughout that night, the patient had drop in urine output, causing metabolic acidosis. We had to start him on hemodialysis. I would have loved to initiate a RRT, but unfortunately, there were major financial constraints. They had already had a huge bill bounding up, and we had to do a sled. Uh, despite all resistive efforts. patient was not doing well continued to hemorrhage went into septic shock and multi organ dysfunction and unfortunately we lost him on uh, 20th of october which was exactly uh, you know 65 or 70 days after the initiation of the whole illness and this is the literature on peripancreatic pseudo aneurysm uh, it's a rare but potentially lethal complication most common vessels are splenic and gastroduodenal arteries early detection and management are paramount given the high mortality associated with the rupture treatment can be with thrombin injection to the occlude the sac arterial embolization or emergency elective surgery mortality rate 11% i doubt so this is actually uh, when you look at a large number of things majority of the time you may electively seal them if they are small ones but with the kind of ongoing persistent organ failure and massive bleed usually they are having very disastrous outcomes so uh, you know just to kind of sum it up uh, not just uh, patients mortality there was a financial and uh, you know kind of economic mortality for the family the direct and indirect cost of pancreatic if you look at that 53% is hospital cost indirect cost we had allowed the patient's family to bring antibody from outside so they could sustain it longer but uh, you know most of these costs of drugs and the indirect cost nursing home cost are really bad and we all must know that an average bad pancreatic is by the time he has entered the 8th week can depending upon the situation can have an incurred loss in indian scenario minimum of 25 to 30 lakhs and this is very important for all of us to keep on guiding the family early on that if you are talking with a severe disease even if the patient may survive what is the cost implication and if things go bad every complication will have an x amount of cost you know kind of burden and very very important that we need to keep on auditing our own costings and keep telling the family in a more appropriate manner early on so that they can think about their finances and choose the options properly this is actually a full summary 
when we talk about whole acute pancreatitis clinical outcome, 90 to 95% of them of acute pancreatitis will have actually mild without any organ failure and less than 1% mortality, which is very encouraging. And most of us get carried away by that fact, not realizing that you are, you are there as seniors to understand which of them, which the 5 of 10% are the ones who would be having severe acutitis and organ failure, which would be addressed by you, where there would be a 60-40 a 60% sterile necrosis and a 40% infected necrosis. Even with sterile necrosis, there could be up to 5% mortality, but majority of them will survive. But of the 40% where there is an infected necrosis, you are talking about an up to 25% mortality. And I would argue that this can actually go up to 50% mortality. So that is something because infected necrosis has always a bad outcome. But with timely antibiotic, good clinical care, critical care associated, multidisciplinary input, this mortality can be brought down to 15%. And uh, if you look at this mortality graph, that's what we have presented over here. The infected necrosis mortality is 30%, while multiple organ failure has the highest organ failure mortality. A single organ failure can still have less than 10%. Sterile necrosis, definitely 12%. Infected mortality, 30%. And... Uh, Overall, you can talk about severe acute pancreatitis as 20% mortality. And this is very important as compared to less than 3% mortality in interstitial or no or little uh, uh, necrosis. So at this point of time, I would actually uh, want the base to you know, kind of take over uh, if any areas have not been touched so that I can talk about that and then we will move out the summary. Yeah. No, no, sir, you please finish it. Then I'll say a few things and then... So, uh, thank you all of you for a patient hearing. I hope we are left with, I can't see how many people are still with us now, but I think uh, it was an interesting kind of uh, unfolding. Uh, the points to remember, the diagnosis should incorporate two of the following three items, upper abdominal pain, biochemical profiling, and the CT or MRI finding or an ultrasound finding. So, this would be important diagnostic word. Persistent organ failure, POF, should be the guiding word. And it defines the severity of acute pancreatitis. Early optimization with optimized tissue perfusion, dynamic resuscitation, not static resuscitation with targets. And don't wait for hemodynamic worsening in the early 48 hours. Give them enough fluid to prevent tissue worsening and interstitial uh, losses of uh, structure. And enteral nutrition to prevent gut failure and infectious complications early on. All patients with severe acute pancreatitis need to be assessed with contrast, enhanced CT scan or MRI. Optimal timing, variable. But around fifth day, uh, uh, if this diagnosis has been established earlier, if not, routine prophylactic antibiotics not recommended at all, unless there are extra pancreatic focus of infection. And patients with POF, that is persistent organ failure, and infected necrosis have the highest risk of death. With these seven-point bullet summary, I would uh, you know kind of add on to last three things. That antibiotics are recommended to treat infected severe acute pancreatitis and you must know what you have given before and what are your causative organisms in your institution. Infected pancreatic necrosis, percutaneous drainage is the first line of treatment and then go up, step up and doing surgical indications as we discussed about that. And uh, minimally invasive surgical strategies are better with uh, less post-op new onset organ failure but require more frequent interventions. So that's very important. So sequential surgical strategies and uh, thank you for a patient hearing. Uh, I think it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, a wonderful patient audience. Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation, sir. Very detailed, very comprehensive, and must have been very tiring for you. Thank you for speaking for so long. Please stop the share screen, sir. So I don't really have anything to say. We are, I think, covered most of the things, but just a point about infections in pancreatitis. So, you know, the fun really starts at around 10 to 14 days, and that is in moderately severe and severe pancreatitis. Interstitial pancreatitis really resolves over a period of one week. So, you know, at 10 to 14 days, at the year, your patient will be having organ failure. Now, the question is, the persistence of organ failure could be either due to the necrotic pancreatitis or the, the severe pancreatitis, or can be due to infection setting in the uh, pancreatitis, the inflamed pancreas. So the, the pancreas does not get infected before 10 to 14 days. That is very important to realize. Before that, you have extra pancreatic infection. So if the patient is not improving, the organ failure is not improving at 10 to 14 days, how do you detect uh, infection? So one, you follow the uh, kinetics of CRP, ProCal, TLC. They can be elevated even at day 10, day to 14. But if there's a jump, like Sarit said, then that is one indicator. Then apart from 
first, if there is clinical deterioration, patient is stable at 10 to 14 days, it's persisting uh, same values, but there is a deterioration. That means an infection has set in. If the pain has worsened suddenly at day 10 to 14 or at any point after that, or if there is gas on CT, gas on CT, like Sir showed, is a definite marker of infection of the pancreas. And if there is pulling out of extra pancreatic infection, you have to send all the cultures and rule out extra pancreatic infection. And 20% of the patients actually have extra pancreatic infection. But if all these markers, which I just said, are present and there's no evidence of extra pancreatic infection, that generally means your pancreatitis is getting infected. And the antibiotics are generally to cover gram negative, but you know, you have all kinds of uh, infection coming in, cells showed enterococcus, which is gram positive. So you, you have to cover with gram positive also. And not initially, but after starting your gram negative and gram positive covered and anaerobic, normally you would give a impenem or meropenem that would cover anaerobic. You have to cover for fungal uh, Canada also if the, your initial antibiotics don't work. Canada infection does not set in too early, but eventually you will have to cover for Canada and the cover is empiric. You normally give fluconazole, but there is no, you know, uh, you don't do a CT guide FNC, so you won't be proving any fungal culture, fungal infection. And you can of course have different culture and all those things and look for multi focal colonization. Uh, so that those are the few things I wanted to add, sir. Rest, I think everything has been covered. And proning, definitely proning, if the patient has ARDS, uh, patients who have uh, intra-abdominal hypertension and uh, ARDS, like in pancreatitis, proning is especially helpful for ARDS. But at the same time, you should make sure that when you prone the patient, the pressure in the abdomen does not rise. You have to keep the abdomen free. You have to suspend it, the pelvis and, you know, the position has to be such that the pressure does not rise in the abdomen. Just a few things, sir. I think we have covered everything wonderfully well. I really don't have anything more to add to that. Thank you. Thank you, Tavesh. Yeah, I would request Prachi, if you're online, just to kind of uh, present yourself. I would thank Prachi for, for this very wonderful kind of uh, sequential presentation of our cases and, uh, uh, you know, kind of laying down all the kind of uh, things in a, a very proper way. And I uh, would only suggest all the listeners that pancreatitis is actually such a, such a kind of uh, what is called a myriad presentation at different times. That it is very vigilant, uh, uh, intensivist is at the uh, at the heart of changing the outcome of this disastrous disease, and I think I have seen majority of the people who, uh, you know, kind of look at the patients intermittently miss out a lot of findings. So you need to really spend time on your patient with acute pancreatitis. A lot of clinical pictures will be variable, and you need to interpret that not in a single light of biochemical profiling or only clinical profiling, but combine all of them, ask people, look at the imaging and see exactly what is happening in the abdomen, which, and maybe at times you need to think like a surgeon, at times you need to think like an interventional radiologist and like a physician. And that's where I think a severe acute pancreatitis management is, is a complete intensive care or holistic intensive care. Hi, Prachi. Hi, sir. Hope you're doing well. Thank you, Prachi. Uh, anything that, uh, that we missed out on the kind of sequential profiling, you can talk about here. Uh, our patient actually uh, had bouts where a where lot of times we thought that we would be worthwhile, you know, kind of putting him on a ventilator early on. But uh, invariably, he would settle down, look good, mobilize. So that's where uh, I, I have learned that probably we should kind of temper our tendency of early, uh, you know, uh, intubation and ventilation for hemodynamically unstable uh, patients because they can rapidly deteriorate sometimes. Trying to fix up the airway which a spontaneous, consciously well-breathing person can hold on. And probably that was one of the advantages that this gentleman hold on for a very long time. He had a very disastrous beginning, uh, but but he held on. I, I hope that this bleeder could have been in some way uh, not a very, very, uh, you know, kind of catastrophic event for him. So also you, one thing I would yeah. mention, sir, we also at many times we were discussing about going ahead and doing a surgery for this patient. At yeah. multiple events, we had discussed this with various surgeons, but every time we did not get a positive feedback from the surgical department. And now very, very uh, when I said. think about it, uh, I don't know if maybe we would have pushed in for a surgery and things would have gone other way around. But now if I think about it, I feel like that. But at that particular time, we never got a positive feedback from any of the surgeons. 
so so invariably i would just say something and tabish you can take over invariably you may retrospectively feel that uh, sometimes a surgery would have done a source control better but believe me pancreatitis is not a situation where uh, source control is so important that you take the risk of breaching the anatomy and the physiological trespass that can happen with an invasion and that has been very clearly shown in multiple studies because very good surgeons who have tried to open up the abdomen and do a good resection after even a wall has been formed had multiple peri procedural complications so though it sounds you know in in, in hindsight an important way in which probably something different could have been done but you are usually never wrong even with the guideline as long as you are conservatively approaching these collections and going ahead with a step up approach over to you tapesh yeah so thank you sir thank you buddy and before so we conclude this session i would uh, like to thank uh, god and guruji his divine holiness papa ji maharaj for showering his blessings on all of us that our program why i swear webinars has been successful it is a small step uh, you know we started one half years ago but a journey of 1000 miles starts with a small step so thank god, thank papa ji maharaj and thank everybody thank you thank you dabesh thank you thank you prachi